miss, but I'm delighted to be here nonetheless, and particularly delighted to be here for Dale Jameson's talk on global warming and the ethics of climate change. Um, reading Dale's accomplishments uh, it makes me feel Lilliputian and narrow. Uh, Dale is the is the got the broadest set of accomplishments I've ever seen. It's in science, it's in social science, and it's in the humanities, uh, and all at once. Right. Um, I'd like to say he's a Renaissance man, except the Renaissance figures typically didn't have that broad an accomplishment. Uh, he's the director of environmental studies at NYU, and the professor of environmental studies and philosophy. Uh, he's an affiliated professor of law there, and he also holds appointments at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, um, which, if you've ever gone there, is a bastion of scientific geekdom, so that starts to show his, his breadth. And he's also a professor of philosophy at a thing called the Sunshine Coast uh, University in Australia, which just screams good sense, right? <laughs> right? And me. Um, he is the author of um, several different books, including uh, Ethics in the Environment, which is on sale just outside um, in 2008. Uh, he's also the author of many, many published papers um, and a worldwide authority on the ethics of climate change, the, the uh, social science of getting the job done, and he knows an awful lot about the science too. So I'm looking forward to this, and uh, let's hear it. Well, thanks for that introduction, Steve. Um, when, it makes me nervous when someone might say that I'm a Renaissance man because that would make me feel even older than I already feel. Um, I might say that um, I've, I spent two very happy years here at Princeton, and indeed the first draft of the, the 2008 book that Steve referred to was actually written here at Princeton, so uh, it always feels a bit like old home week when I when I come back, so I'm very pleased to be here. Also, uh, I want to begin by saying something a little bit personal about the environmental justice movement. Um, I was living in upstate New York when this issue about Love Canal began to break across the television screens of our, of our region, and in part because I was living very close to that, to that area, uh, it, it, it caught my attention. And then it wasn't long after that that the events in Warren County, North Carolina, began to reach public attention. And that was very close to where I had gone to graduate school and where I had moved to upstate New York from. So, I, so for me, the environmental justice movement, uh, both as a movement uh, by people of color and also uh, in a white working class community, um, affected me very deeply early on. And then, in the, and then in the 1980s, I can remember, these years have a way of sort of all becoming one. But at some time in the 1980s, the AAAS actually had an environmental justice panel. And I was on that panel along with Bob, Bob Bullard and other people were talking about toxics in local communities. And I was talking about global environmental justice. Um, but over the years, I think some of these issues have come closer together. I can remember a time in the in the uh, late 1990s, uh, when Mickey Glantz and I organized a workshop on the ethics of climate change that, um, uh, that Professor Wright and Professor Bullard were in attendance at as well. Um, but, but at the same time, I mean, the kinds of concerns that I'm going to be talking about, that is, concerns that really are at the global level and are really more normative uh, and more rooted in uh, philosophical ethics and political philosophy and political theory, they're, they're, I think they're importantly complementary to the kind of concern with environmental justice that comes out of the social movement. Um, but nevertheless, there are certainly differences of emphasis, and I think to some extent probably uh, differences in substance as well. Um, I do want to say that I think in the end we need both of these kinds of work, and I think we certainly need work in political theory and political philosophy and ethics, if we're going to get beyond the embedded and intractable collective action problems that many of our environmental problems are really foundering on. Uh, and I don't think that we'll get there 
simply through interest group politics. And indeed, interest group politics, in the end, always comes down on the side of the rich and powerful anyway. So I think in that sense, we do need the kinds of theorizing that a number of people at this conference are doing. All right. Well, onward. Uh, so my thesis today, you'll see, by the way, that I'm, I'm a master at uh, unimaginative PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> And my, my thesis today is that climate change poses the most complex, profound, and important environmental justice issue that we have yet encountered. And I mean each of those words literally, complex, profound, and important. The consequences of climate change are going to far outrun the impacts, I think, of any other environmental justice issue. And in a way, my most important point is going to be the third. Although climate change will and indeed already is disproportionately harming the poor and powerless, it's going to challenge our conventional moral and political concepts, okay? So in a way, the point of my talk is that climate change poses a profound question of individual morality and of political morality, but it challenges us to reshape and reform these concepts if we're going to actually be able to address them in those terms, which I think we desperately need to do for reasons I may or may not have time to dwell on in this talk. Hurricane Katrina. We've heard a lot about Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina burst onto the national consciousness. Um, many people around America were shocked and stunned that such a thing could be happening in the United States. The idea in particular that there might be some confluence between something that we conceptualize as a natural disaster and issues of race and class that are clearly social matters, that they should come together in such a profound way, was shocking for many people in the United States. They simply didn't think of these issues as being in the same category. Um, but of course, this is a very ahistorical understanding of natural hazards and natural events. The poor and powerless have always suffered most from extreme climatic events. Uh, and this, this has been well documented in work that goes back to the study of the Little Ice Age in Europe, a period between roughly 1300 and 1850, a period that wasn't an unbroken cooling period. It was actually, climate was quite unstable in many regions during that time. But it was an age of famines and of epidemics. Some people have argued that the shaping of the modern European order was, in fact, in consequence to these climatic events. I don't think we have to say anything that extreme, but it is certainly the case that we know from the historical record that this, the climate disruptions of this period disproportionately affected people who were poor, mainly through famine and disease. But, of course, we can look at something much more recent than this, and indeed prior to Hurricane Katrina, there was a heat wave in Chicago um, in July 1995. There's a wonderful book about this by my NYU colleague Eric Kleinberg, if anyone is interested. This heat wave killed 739 people, more than four times as many as had been killed in the Oklahoma City bombing that had occurred three months earlier. But yet the Oklahoma City bombing, for all sorts of reasons, not all of them bad, is an iconic event in American history in a way that the Chicago heat wave isn't. And the victims of that heat wave were disproportionately low-income, elderly, African-American males living in violence-prone parts of the city. Indeed, um, many of the people who were found dead as a result of, of heat stroke were actually living in apartments where the windows were nailed shut because the concerns with personal safety and security were so intense that they, they trumped any other kind of um, desire to try to stay alive that you might think people would be acting on in that, in that basis. Okay, now, the point that I, I, I want to make uh, uh, about this now is that in, in some ways, you know, we can spend a lot of time worrying about the attribution of particular events to climate change. And in a way, it doesn't really matter because what we know is that these are the kinds of events that are going to occur more frequently and probably with greater intensity in the future. So this is going to be the, the world that we face, and it's a world in which we know these extreme events impact the poor and the powerless more frequently than the rich and the powerful. Now, this isn't true just with respect to Europe and Katrina 
and Chicago, but of course it happens internationally as well. Hurricane Mitch struck Honduras in 1998. It killed about 6,500 people, causing two to four billion dollars in damages. This is an amount 15 to 30 percent of Honduras's GDP. So you're essentially talking about uh, much of the infrastructure of what was then the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere simply being wiped away by this event, by a single event. Now, what makes this even more tragic is that in 1974, Hurricane Fifi had swept through the same region had killed about 8,000 people and caused about a billion dollars in damage. After Hurricane Fifi in 1974, there were, there were intense academic studies that were brought to bear. There were meetings of, of NGOs and international agencies and donors conferences and so on. The studies indicated that destruction of Hurricane Fifi was exacerbated by social, economic, and political conditions in particular, deforestation was identified, and also the displacement of campesinos into isolated valleys and onto sleep, steep hillsides by foreign-owned banana plantations and large-scale beef ranches. Well, after all these studies were done, we knew what was exacerbating the problem. We know that this is a region in which hurricanes are going to occur. The same thing happens in 1998 with Hurricane Mitch. After Mitch, once again, the academics flood into the region. The NGOs start having meetings. The donors' conferences start taking place. And the report of the 1999 donors' conference states that the tragedy, quote, was magnified by man-made decisions due to poverty that led to chaotic urbanization and soil degradation. Like, duh. But yet, the same thing continues to happen over and over. And I want to give you a particularly vivid example of that. This is a, a quotation, uh, which is uh, a roughly contemporaneous account. On the north coast, the Aguan River flooded big after Fifi. In a closed base, it is a closed basin and dumps huge amounts of water straight into the ocean. Not only did the same flooding occur with Mitch, but it carried the village of Santa Rosa de Aguan out to sea, drowning dozens. There was no effort in the headwaters to do something to avoid this repeat catastrophe. In other words, it was, I mean, it was essentially the same things were happening. You were getting mudslides. You were getting people living in floodplains, that their villages were being swept away. After Fifi in 1974, despite all the donors' meetings and the conferences and the good intentions, nothing was really done to reconstruct this country and to give people any other options. So what happened was that people returned to the same places, the inevitable hurricane occurred again with exactly the same results. Now, this is the future. This is what's going to continue to happen with greater frequency and perhaps greater intensity as the global warming that is now underway becomes more intense. And just to, to, to summarize, in terms of the disproportionate impact, 96% of disaster-related deaths in recent years have occurred in developing countries. Now, this might also make you reflect a little on our media and how it is that our consciousness of natural disasters is, is structured. Um, there have been some tornadoes, actually, over the weekend that are getting a lot of play in America. And, uh, and again, I don't want in any way to, to downplay or diminish the importance and severity and the tragedy of, of these events. But just looking at the American media, you could easily come to the conclusion that natural disasters only strike people who live in trailers in the American South or Midwest, right? And the fact that when you're talking about natural disasters in America, you're talking about um, a, a, a events that are extremely and profoundly affecting for a small number of people. But when you're talking about natural disasters in the developing world, you're talking about events that literally can set back the prospects of development for years and even for decades. And that's something that I think we really need uh, to come to terms with. We need to start understanding that this term natural disaster means something different in a global context than it does in a domestic context. Now, I want to talk a little about Bangladesh. Uh, I mean, we could talk about other countries, but, but Bangladesh in many ways provides a kind of 
good case study for focusing the mind on what we have to look forward to in terms of what the human impacts of climate change are going to mean in much of the developing world. So Bangladesh is in a region which is prone to cyclones. Cyclones are part of life in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is also a country which much of the country is, uh, is a meter below sea level. And so it's historically prone to great floods. In 1998, 68% of the land mass of Bangladesh was flooded, affecting about 30 million people. In 2007, 3,000 people were killed by floods, and 7 million were affected. Now, just as a footnote, many, many more people would have been killed. But Bangladesh, which is a very poor country, it's actually the world's largest developing country in terms of population, um, actually had a very, very effective early warning system, which succeeded in saving a great, a great many lives. But even so, 7 million people were made homeless or lost their livelihoods as a result of that cyclone. Now, Atik Rahman, who is one of the lead authors on the IPCC report, writes that we expect the severity of extreme events to increase. Their frequency will also increase. At least 20% of the country will be inundated with salt water. So our food system will collapse. Some 20 million people will be displaced over time. When the next cyclone comes, and again, the next cyclone will come, it will penetrate further, and it will kill more people. The refugees have started. People are, are moving already. The tides are getting higher. All this translates into catastrophe. OK, so that's the world that we need to face. Now, this slide. Um, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing everything bad people do with PowerPoint. I'm reading, the, I'm reading half the slides to you, and the other half I'm telling you not to read at all. Um, but this slide comes from the latest IPCC report, and it's actually a wonderful slide to look at in some detail, because what you see on the horizontal axis is degree of warming in centigrade, and then you have various effects for water, ecosystems, food, coastlines, health, and so on and so forth. And essentially what this slide shows you is that the further we go to the right on the horizontal axis, um, the more severe the impacts will be in all of these areas. Uh, and there's, as I say, a lot to talk about with these impacts. And we can talk more in discussion if you want. But basically the idea is we, we're, we, we've, we've experienced a, war a warming so far of about 7 tenths of a degree centigrade. We're probably committed to another seven tenths, another eight tenths. Um, depends what day of the week it is and how much we've been emitting lately. Um, on most scenarios, up to about two degrees centigrade, uh, it is, as a famous Princeton alum, Donald Rumsfeld, once said in another context, it's a real mess for some people and for some regions, but there are some winners as well as losers. Once we go beyond two degrees centigrade, it just starts to be a real mess for everyone. Uh, and, and so much of the challenge that the world faces, uh, I think really in 2009 is the key year, is whether we're going to take effective policy action to stay below that two degrees centigrade threshold. And again, that's something we can talk more about in discussion. So in this context, the climate change issue is increasingly being framed as and being viewed as a moral question and a question that poses issues of global justice. So Salim Hook, another uh, uh, citizen of Bangladesh and another IPCC lead author, has said one group of people, namely those who consume the most, particularly in wealthy countries, have caused the problem. And another group, namely poor people, especially in poorer countries, will suffer the brunt of the adverse consequences in the near term. The issue goes beyond mitigation alone, though mitigation is urgent to prevent even greater and more catastrophic problems in 50 years' time. And it goes beyond adaptation, such as helping people prepare for the unavoidable impacts in the next few decades. A major challenge now is to find ways to compensate people for the damage that has already been done. So there's a lot in this 
passage that I, I want to take uh, apart slowly. Now, now, what Huck is suggesting is that climate change involves some people, namely rich people, mostly in rich countries, causing harms to other people. Now, I think it's important to recognize that these people who are being harmed by climate change, some of them are already alive. Indeed, some of them have already been harmed, and I'll show you a slide about that in a few minutes. But we're also talking about the harms of climate change stretching out into the further future. And I think one thing that people who don't work on climate change often don't really understand is that when it comes to many injustices, injustices and many harms, I mean, suppose I'm standing on your foot and this is an immoral act, this is an unjust act. Well, when I stop standing on your foot, the pain subsides, the injustice is over. But when it comes to greenhouse gases, when it comes to carbon dioxide, for example, those molecules of carbon dioxide hang around the atmosphere for centuries in many cases. And the impacts of emitting greenhouse gases will go on for a millennium or more. So it's as if the injustice is that I stand on your foot for a while, and finally I take my foot off, but guess what? The pain gets worse and goes on longer through time. That's the kind of problem we're dealing with with climate change, and that's why it's imperative that we act sooner rather than later. Justice delayed in this case is not just justice delayed, it is very, quite seriously, literally, justice denied for a very, very, very long time. So the climate change that we're now causing affects present people, and it will affect many people who are now alive even more dramatically towards the end of their lifetime, but it's also going to affect future generations of those unborn. And also, it will deeply affect non-human nature. Climate change will literally remake the natural world. It will drive species to extinction, uh, and it will have many other effects. And one question climate change raises is to what extent we think concepts like justice can be applied to non-human nature, as well as to our fellow human beings. Now, um, in the climate change discussion, there's often a debate between people who want to focus on mitigating climate change, where that means something very specific in the climate change debate. Climate change mitigation are those actions that you take to stabilize or reduce the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, okay? Either through reducing emissions or by creating carbon sinks. Adaptation, on the other hand, is what people do to respond to a warming world. So when you talk about building seawalls and dikes and, uh, and uh, moving population centers away from vulnerable areas, those are all forms of, of adaptation. Geoengineering, which is beginning to come more onto the horizon, are those actions that we might take, some of them very futuristic in concept, others not so much, to actually try to change the character of climate itself. Now, one thing that I think is really important to recognize is that much of the talk about justice and ethics and climate change has been on the mitigation side. And that is very important. When we talk about carbon taxes or cap and trade or what the post-Kyoto regime might look like and so on, we need to take seriously who's going to bear the cost for the transition of the global economy away from carbon. It's important issues of ethics and justice. But there are also important issues of ethics and justice that arise with respect to adaptation. Countries like Bangladesh have not significantly contributed to the problem that they will suffer from. They don't have the resources to adapt to the new world that's coming. Who's going to pay for that transition? Now, you're talking about a political climate in which it's very difficult to motivate Americans, for example, to spend money across jurisdictional boundaries. We even heard a little bit of a dispute about Louisiana tax money going to Michigan and whether that was a good thing or not. Well, what about American tax money going to Bangladesh, right? Or to Egypt, where the Nile Valley is another area that's quite, that's quite vulnerable. But those are the kinds of issues that we're going to have to deal with. I also want to emphasize a point that came out of the discussion earlier today. I was very glad to hear David emphasize, but it came up in some other talks as well, 
often when people talk about questions of ethics or justice and climate change, they're talking about distribution. How do we allocate the costs, for example, of reshaping the global economy? Participatory justice, the term I would use, is hugely important in these discussions as well. And particularly in the discussion of geoengineering, it hardly comes up at all. It's as if some bright young men at Lawrence uh, Livermore are simply going to turn the thermostat down um, you know, on the global temperature and, and make things nice again without actually consulting the people of the world um, about whether they think this is a good idea. So questions of participatory justice run all through this debate, or should, just as questions of distributive justice do as well. OK, now, um, if we look at this problem uh, just in a relatively gross way, um, we, can, we can see that it conforms very nicely to, um, you know, to a paradigm of being an ethical question, of a question of one person harming another person. So, so this graph is essentially a graph of greenhouse gas emissions in the year 2000 by country. And the, uh, the redder or browner the color, the more emissions from that country. Uh, the greener or yellower, the less emissions from that country. Now you can see that just at a glance, that what you essentially can see, what, what this graph shows is that the global north is doing the emitting, not the global south. And it would be even more striking if this were on the basis of per capita emissions. Now, the World Health Organization did a study, and a lot of these studies are controversial, and I'm not going to worry about the details, but, but they did a study which they claimed that by 2000, there had already been a documented ex excess mortality as a result of climate change that had occurred. And what this graph shows you again is that the green and yellow is a relatively low mortality from climate change in 2000. The red and the brown is a higher mortality rate from climate change. So you can see that the people in the north aren't the ones doing the dying. It's the people in the south who are doing the dying. And most of this mortality at this point is, uh, is due to an increased incidence in some extreme climatic events, uh, primarily. Now, if you put these two graphs together, you see that they fit very nicely together, that people in the north are doing the emitting, People in the South are doing the dying, right? Looks like a textbook case of a moral problem. But now what I want to do is to suggest that things are not quite as simple as they may seem. This is our paradigm in our, in our moral consciousness and in our legal systems of a moral problem. Jack intentionally steals Jill's bike, okay? Jack, does some, Jack is the agent. He has bad intent. Um, he's harming Jill. The causal nexus is there. We know how to deal with those kinds of issues. We know how to think about them. We know how to conceptualize them. We have no problem saying Jack did something wrong. Right? This is an immoral action. But let's complicate things a little. Suppose that Jack is part of an unacquainted group of strangers, each of which acting independently takes one part of Jill's bike resulting in the bike's disappearance. Well, you know, I mean, I think we still have the intuition, but it's, you know, it's starting, you're starting to go, huh? Example three, Jack takes one part from each of a large number of bikes, one of which belongs to Jill. So Jack steals a bicycle, but simply by imposing a very small harm on a number of different Example four, Jack and Jill live on different continents, and the loss of Jill's bike is the consequence of a causal chain that begins with Jack ordering a used bike at a shop. So in this case, now Jack has simply become a mindless consumer. Not, not like us, of course. Uh, and we wonder about Jack's responsibility in this case. Now suppose that Jack lives many centuries before Jill and consumes materials that are essential to bike manufacturing. As a result, it will not be possible for Jill to have a bicycle. Hmm, this sounds a little like Jack is living unsustainably. 
And then we go to example six, acting independently. We put all these pieces together. Acting independently, Jack and a large number of unacquainted people set in motion a chain of events that causes a large number of future people who will live in another part of the world from ever having bikes. Now, what I want to suggest is this. Not that this is a perfect analogy, but if we do begin with our paradigm of a moral problem, and then we begin to try to, to change the terms of that paradigm in a way that it reflects what's peculiar about the climate change issue, we come to a place where it no longer conforms to our paradigm of a moral problem. Now, I don't want to say, oh, well, okay, let's admit that, right? It's not like Jack stealing Joel's bike. Party on. No, what I want to say is that for us to adequately account for that harm in our moral, political, legal systems, we're going to have to reshape and reform our notions of responsibility. Our intuitions are going to have to be educated by the way causal networks work in a world in which technological reach is very, very great. And this is a very difficult challenge. And it's difficult in part because it's not just a, I mean, there is a reason why we have the paradigm of morality that we have, right? It has to do with what we're like as biological creatures, what our challenges have been. And this is a quotation from the psychologist Dan Gilbert, which I think summarizes the problem very well. When people feel insulted or disgusted, they generally do something about it, such as whacking each other over the head or voting. Moral emotions are the brain's call to action. Though all human societies have moral rules about food and sex, none has a moral rule about atmospheric chemistry. And so we're outraged by every breach of protocol except Kyoto. Yes, global warming is bad but it doesn't make us feel nauseated or angry or disgraced. And thus, we don't feel compelled to rail against it as we do against other momentous threats to our species, such as flag burning. The fact is that if climate change were caused by gay sex or by the practice of eating kittens, millions of protesters would be massing in the streets. Now, uh, so I, I took this idea, and I think, I think Gilbert, in a way, overstates the point. I mean, I think that our moral sentiments can be educated, they can stretch, they, they can be developed. I'm asking us to do that. I hope we, do, we need to do the theoretical work to make that happen. But if you take the icon of, of, of global warming, the, the polar bear under threat, I think one nice way of summarizing Gilbert's point is in the following cartoon, which I'll just let you look at. Um, the, the fact that the polar bears are disappearing is not really enough to get us going. So the polar bears organize and reframe, reframe the question of their own survival and existence. Okay? Now, you might think that, um, that what this shows is that thinking about this uh, as a question of individual moral responsibility runs into all of these problems. I mean, how can I learn to associate driving my BMW with you know, causing harm to the descendants of Africans who will live at the end of the next century? You might just think, well, you know, that just shows we need to think about this in terms of nation states, where we have a real, a real sense uh, of what an injustice involves, right? And we go back to that map that I showed you. You've got the countries of the north doing the emitting, the countries in the south doing the suffering. So maybe we should reframe this, not as a question of individual morality, but as a question of political justice among nations. But I want to suggest that the same sort of difficulties in extrapolating from the paradigm also infect this way of looking at things. And we can begin to see that by looking at the following two, two charts. Now, you don't have to worry too much about what these units are. What they relate to our per capita fossil fuel carbon emissions, okay? Um, and, and, and what this graph shows you is that these per capita emissions are very, very different from state to state in the United States, okay? So we can, decide, so, so we can say the United States is one of the world's largest per capita emitters. Yeah, but not California. 
And guess what? Dick Cheney's home state is the worst of the worst. Not that you're surprised by that. Okay? So when we begin to look at this data, what we see is that we can start to disaggregate this data. And we could do it in other ways, too. We could do this on, on people who've done it on race, and, and you could do it on class, and you could do it on all sorts of things. But we see that not all Americans are created equal when it comes to the emissions that they're responsible for. And in fact, what this graph shows you is that the differences among states is actually becoming greater through time. And that's due to a number of reasons, I think. Some of it has to do with policy choices that have been made by different states in different regions of the country. Some of it has to do, I suspect, with different degrees of environmental consciousness in different places uh, as well. It also has to do with changing industrial patterns and so on. So as a matter of fact, we're getting to be more different from each other in terms of our carbon emissions through time. The same thing uh, can also be shown in other countries. This is fairly old data, but I, I, I don't think uh, that the point is very much different. Uh, what you see from this graph is that essentially a rich rural person is responsible for less energy use in India than a middle income urban person. So the rural urban distinction is hugely important uh, in the Indian context. Now, the, I mean, the point is this then. Climate change, yes, you can say in some sense, the countries of the North committing aggression against countries of the South and so on. But ultimately, climate change is actually caused primarily by rich people wherever they live and suffered by poor people wherever they live. Um, the atmosphere doesn't care whether it's my BMW that's changing climate or whether it's the BMW that's being driven in China or being driven in Rwanda, for that matter, right? It, the, the, the behavior is having exactly the same effect in terms of the atmospheric chemistry and in terms of its in, impact on climate. Now, um, Steve McCall has been doing some work in this area and has shown, for example, that 500 million people, which is roughly one-twelfth or a little less of the global population, is responsible for half of the world's emissions. Okay? So, and we also know, if, if we look at it on the vulnerability side, right, and, and not just the emission side, it's sobering to think that in the United, I mean, look at what we know about Hurricane Katrina. Look at what we know about vulnerability in the United States. Look at what we know about inequality in the United States. There are more poor people in the United States, probably, who will suffer from climate change than there are in many other countries which are, in fact, much poorer than the United States. I mean, one kind of classic textbook example is Cuba, for example actually has an extremely good system, uh, a early warning system, and has a, uh, a relatively uh, high degree of invulnerability to extreme climatic events compared to most other countries in the, in the Caribbean basin. Okay? So even though Cuba is a poor country, it will fare better with respect to many of these natural disasters than will parts of the United States. So it's not, I mean, so the problem with looking at this just simply nationally is it's not just that, um, that rich people, wherever they live, are, are causing the problem. It's also that poor people, wherever they live, are also going to bear the burdens. So the, the problem, I think, that we're stuck with here, I mean, at least with respect to getting an international regime, is an international regime to control greenhouse gas emissions is going to be created by nation states. It has to be created by nation states. But yet, it's not nation states that are the primary generators of the problem, nor uh, uh, recipients of the harms. And that creates all kinds of difficulties in terms of negotiation strategies. OK, now, uh, I don't want to go on for much longer. But I do want to say that this, so, I mean, so what I've been doing in a way is saying, yes, I think climate change poses these issues of individual moral responsibility and of political justice among nations, but that we have to reframe these concepts in order to adequately account for them. But I think that even that much is still missing something that's very important that 
the climate change problem confronts us with. And that is some idea that I'm going to call respect for nature. Okay? And there are different ways of trying to give a philosophical ground for this notion of respect for nature. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that in just the five or six minutes I'm going to try to wrap things up in. But I think the first thing that we need to recognize is that humans being part of nature, yes. Humans have always modified their environment, yes. But the scale of the human impact on nature today can be characterized as the human domination of nature. And there's a number of ways of trying to do that. There was an old article by Peter Batusek and others in 1997 in Science that concluded at the end of this paper that it's clear that we live on a human-dominated planet. And they pointed out, for example, that between one-third and one-half of Earth's land surface had been transformed by human action. Carbon dioxide at that point had increased 30% above pre-industrial baselines. More nitrogen is now being fixed by humanity than by all other terrestrial organisms combined. Uh, more than half of all accessible surface water, fresh surface water, is being appropriated by humanity, and so on and so forth. And we can go on. We can look at the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, for example, that was uh, released just in the last few years, which calls into question whether the Earth's ecosystems in the future are going to be able to sustain human life. Uh, we can look at the uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature's Living Planet report, which claims that sometime in the light, late 1980s, humanity started appropriating more from the planet than the planet was able to actually replace. Uh, and, we can, and we can go on. But what I want to say is that this amounts to a pattern of the human domination of nature. No longer are we living with nature, are we affecting nature. It's not a question of you know, absolute wilderness and, and bifurcating humanity from nature. It's just that there is some line that we've crossed which we can think of as human domination. And I now just want to conclude by saying that at the end of the day, this indicates a kind of lack of humility, of temperance, of, in some sense, knowing our place in the natural order that what, in fact, climate change is an expression of is that we and our economic systems and our ways of life are essentially treating the Earth and its fundamental systems as if it were simply a toy that we could treat carelessly, however we wish. Another way of thinking about it is that it's as if we're applying slash and burn agriculture at a planetary scale, right? as if we could just migrate to the next planet once, we've, once this one has lost its ability to sustain our lives. Now, I think there are a number of reasons why that should worry us. I mean, one reason uh, is it poses questions, and again, this, this in some ways goes back to some of the things David was getting at, about what constitutes a good human life. What kind of people do we want to be? What kind of character do we want to have? What, what does human flourishing consist in? Does it consist in this kind of arrogance that can treat all of nature in this way? Or is a high quality of life involved, in some sense, recognizing limits? But there's also a very important sense in which nature provides an important source of meaning in our lives. It's what we tell stories about. It's what our mythologies are about. It's how we situate ourselves, those who have come before and those who will become after. And in turning nature into an artifact, into a human artifact, we cut ourselves off from that source of meaning. Now, I don't think that means that humans, in some sense, couldn't survive in an entirely artifactualized world. In some ways, the great, my greater fear is that they can. In some biological sense. The problem is we will have cut ourselves off from this whole history of what it means to be human living on planet Earth. Let me just close by, uh, by giving you an analogy uh, in terms of the way that I think about it. Representational painting. Princeton has a wonderful art museum. While you're visiting Princeton, you should get over to the art museum. Representational painting is not the only kind of painting that's valuable. But it is one kind of painting 
that is extremely valuable. And indeed, it even seems plausible to suppose that the entire practice of painting as a visual art derived and emerged from representational painting. Representational painting, in order to work, requires some contrast between foreground and background. In representational painting, there is something in the foreground whose meaning is determined by and conditioned by its background and what we perceive it as being against. Now, what I want to suggest analogously is that nature really provides the background to what we think of as a meaningful human life. And when we turn that background into a human artifact, we have lost at least one of the important conditions for one source of meaning in our lives. And that, in the end, I think, also amounts to an injustice. It's an injustice against ourselves, an injustice against those who've come before, and an injustice to those who are going to live in the future. So just to conclude then, again, climate change poses the most complex, profound, and important environmental justice issue that we've yet encountered. But it will require us to reshape our concepts of justice and responsibility. But the good news, I think, is that if we succeed in such a reconfiguration, it may give us a new sense of community across generations, national boundaries, and even species. And that could allow us to go into the next century with the resources to solve problems that, at the moment, we can barely understand. Thank you. So, Kirk, should I just call on some people? Is that, is that OK? Yeah. Yeah, well, that would be too soon. How do you think about transitioning a culture which is um, demeaned on instant gratification, which can answer its needs for nature by building an avatar on a computer and wandering around in an imagined world? How do you transition that culture into thinking in a multi-generational
I want to ask you a bit to elaborate on uh, this intergenerational concept that we were talking about. One of the debates uh, that it's been ongoing among economists interested in this issue has to do with, you know, discounting the future and how much is the present generation, uh, how much is that worth versus future generations? I mean, you have an external on one end of the spectrum and Nordhaus on the other. And I want to hear your views uh, from a kind of philosophical viewpoint, how, you know, how best to address this issue uh, in the context of, you know, the costs and benefits, I guess, of, of acting now. I guess my question comment relates back to the first question, and that is um, one of the things that struck me in being here today is I've researched religious involvement on environmental issues for the last 20 some odd years, and we really haven't brought that into the conversation much at all, but there's a place where the discourse of justice is firmly grounded, and I guess to counter the cynicism, for me to read that the Southern Baptist, leader of the Southern Baptist Convention, and two previous ones have now signed a statement saying that we must address climate change. It's a huge, huge change in that block of Republican voters. And I wouldn't have predicted that even three years ago, maybe not even one year ago, from the kind of statements that were coming out of the SBC in even 2007. So I think in that sense of a place where moral discourse goes on, we really are seeing a change. We've got the National Association of Evangelicals coming and saying this is about how you treat your neighbor. So I guess I would add that in to your countering of the kind of cynicism, at least from someone watching that discourse, that there's lots of problems with it, of course, but it's still a, a drastic change. I find it interesting that you're talking about the um, moral arguments and you're trying to reframe it. I'm wondering if you could talk about how the media 
plays a role in this framing in that we now have access to N100 channels that take us around the world with a single click. Does that help us as Americans connect to the injustices in the world? And do you think that's a place that we can um, exploit? I have a mic and I'm going to use it. Um, yeah, Dale, I thought, you know, for a professional uh, philosopher, you're being a little bit cagey on what those concepts of justice and responsibility ought to look like. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how we need to think about those things. Uh, okay, well, um, I'll, I'll try to be, I really will try to be brief. If people ask me such hard questions, I'll try to be short answers. Uh, so the first thing about individual moral responsibility, I do think there's a body of philosophical should drive people to see that, in fact, there is culpable moral responsibility in the 
all going to be the same. But that work needs to be much more mainstream, you know, uh, including in the scholarship and in political scholarship as well. And, and there, but there is a body of work there that's a very useful body of work. Um, I think when it comes to these questions of political justice, I think to a great extent, you know, we're still working in this Westphalian model, this Westphalian worldview of the nation state as, 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 as an entity. And that's under assault from a lot of different directions, in part because of the pressure of globalization. But just a lot more is fine. A lot more work needs to be done. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, but but anyway, that nation state system is breaking down under a wide range of pressures, but that discussion is not as far advanced as, as, as one would like. Then finally, I think the key idea is this idea of respect for nature, because a lot of what happens is, I think, is a lot of environmentalists and, and uh, public policy people, when you start talking about respect for nature or something like this, they think that you're committed to thinking that, you know, paramecia have rights or it's wrong to eat broccoli or so on, you know, things like this. And, and there, I think, a lot of work can and is being done, and some of my recent work is directed towards this, is really trying to give a good philosophical defense of what, after all, are really traditional attitudes that humans have had towards nature, without supposing that there is some strange set of rights that you're attributing to the nation. And I think it can be done, but that's the work that's very, very much in progress. So I think we can just, for example, ask, we can treat a work of art with great respect and even think of it as valuable for its own sake without thinking that the work of art has rights or is sentient or, or talks to you nicely. So I think we can think the same thing about, about human relationships. If that's the direction. With, uh, I wanted to address the, what you were just talking about in terms of uh, our relationship to nature, and what comes to mind is uh, a comment that Robert Kennedy Jr. made in this same context, and that was that nature is the infrastructure of our society, and in fact, every major spiritual religious leader was enlightened in nature, whether it was by the water, under a tree, in a cave, and that um, you take that concept and then you talk about, again, some of the technical science issues that we're dealing with today in terms of um, the migration of birds and the migration of bees and how climate change has incapacitated the traditional migrations. So then you can juxtapose, you know, history and spirituality with the hard science of, you know, when you get rid of a species, then you have uh, a, 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 the food chain is, is implicated. So um, instead of saying this or that animal or species has rights, if you weave a better, more complete picture of how um, some of the plants and animals impact things we take for granted in our everyday life, and I think those connections are not being made in the media and in education at large. And when you do that, then it all makes a lot more sense. Thank you. 
At the same time, I mean, I guess there's just two things I want to say about this. This is not new to anyone. One is it's not just the fact of the warming or the fact of the cooling. It's essentially the rapidity of the transition between the two things based on nature. So in some sense, you know, for us to sort of now step on the brake, like it's definitely accelerated, even if it's going in the right direction, it's just it's just going to make things worse, especially given the fact um, the knowledge base we're doing that. That's all I want to say on that issue. It's an interesting and difficult question. But, but now the geoengineering issue is important. So just a couple things to say about geoengineering. The first thing is there's a lot of different things that people talk about in geoengineering. And one of the things, you know, ranging from putting salt lake into the atmosphere to test the capacity to replenish uh, uh, as a way of blocking solar radiation, absorbing solar radiation, uh, to launching space mirrors as our old friend uh, Edward Keller to iron fertilization to do carbon uptake in the ocean and then sink it into the deep sea. Um, and they all have somewhat different consequences and effects. Um, now, I, I'll just make two comments. I first wrote on this topic in 1996, uh, an, an article on climatic change. It was called The Ethics of Intentional Climate Change. And, um, and recently, I revisited this topic at Bishop's AAAS meeting, and I was struck by a couple of things. The first is, the science is not advanced much at all in, in most of the, putting the salt lake in the side. When it comes to ocean fertilization and so on, there hasn't been a lot of, of progress in terms of really being able to predict really what all these substances do and so on. Point two, one of the things I talked about in 96 was that if anyone is thinking about changing global climate, they had better consult the globe, <laughs> right? And we don't even know how to do that. I mean, what is the international body that would have confidence over a proposal to change global climate? And what's disappointing to me is that people haven't even really thought very much about that question. That usually when scientists get together on this issue, it becomes G lives and maybe cool, maybe we could, and so on and so forth. And this issue of legitimation is hugely important. So just one anecdote about, about this. There was a proposal by this company called Plankton to dump a bunch of iron piles into the ocean and create a phytoplankton bloom and plant stuff from it, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And, and, nobody, and, and, and finally what happened is that there's this thing called the London Anti-Dumping Convention that basically said this is not a good idea because this is dumping the sea and we don't let people do that. Now, yay, everyone's glad it didn't happen because it's not fully consented. But the thing is, it's weird when a proposal to change global climate is being governed by a legal instrument that's about pollution at sea, right? So that suggests we need a lot of development of the legal regimes here to really think about this issue. Now the last thing I'll say about geoengineering is, to me, the geoengineering case is a little like the ticking bomb case, right? So choose your favorite bad guy in the current administration who says, who you think you're someone against torture, and your favorite bad guy says, yeah, but suppose there's a ticking bomb, and we know that so and so, you know. And of course, the answer is always yes. But uh, yes, you would torture. You know, I mean, yes, not just this world. 19 solar systems would be blown up. And, you know, you can just raise this, so you don't have to do it. But the reason we don't like that is because it's preparing for the ticking bomb scenario. And the presupposition that we could know when we had it. And that's the fear, I think, with a lot of geoengineering. There's really two fears here. Um, one is, if you, you know, I don't think anyone is against 
curiosity-driven research into geoengineering systems. When you start getting agency-driven research, when you start getting a public policy that's going to gear up a program for geoengineering, that's the first step towards implementation. That's not just a question of scientific research or public way of implementation. And the second thing is, is what we're getting, especially now on the fertilization side, and we'll get it other places too, is the private carbon credit market ramping up. And so you're going to start getting large financial incentives to, to do things that will keep climbing. And, and I actually have used and talked the analogy of the pharmaceutical medical context as being, and the effect that the pharmaceutical industry is having research as being a potential thing to avoid here, because the carbon credit market could become a very large influence.